And welcome everybody to this community conversation on pregnancy and infant loss. Um, Stephanie, thank you for reaching out about the topic and um, it's just also really timely this month for Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. Um, I'm going to say very little and just participate, which is really nice for me, um, but I'll help moderate questions as folks have them. So if you do an intro, Stephanie, and then take us away, we'll do like some chatting and then we'll really open it up for questions towards the end. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I'm going to try to, I'm trying to figure out how to not look at myself, but look at you all. There we go. Um, so just first, thank you everybody for coming. I know that this isn't you know, an easy topic and I just really appreciate the support and the interest um, in being here. So what I thought I would do is just introduce myself, um, tell you a little bit about my work and then um, indulge a little in telling you um, my own personal reproductive history in that I think it, it speaks to um, acknowledging the kind of spectrum of how people experience loss and kind of how they deal with it. And so is the only reason I'm sharing um, just the specifics of it. But, um, and so then I would want to just give you a little bit of background of how I came to think about this topic itself. And then um, at, after I'm done with that, I'm gonna give some real, like try to just have practical tips about um, how to support um, either clients or, or friends and loved ones going through um, through this experience. And then I would love obviously, you know, to open it up to Q&A. And so um, I I'm, I'm apologize in advance that obviously I'm just skimming the surface here of all the complexity that that birth and loss activates and so hopefully this is just just to get us started and I'm um, you know really excited to to engage in, in a conversation um, so I became a doula in 2007 um, and part of what brought me to this work which I don't always share when you know clients ask you usually it's one of the kind of questions that is recommended on websites about what to ask your doula um, you know like why did you become a doula and I don't always share this because I think it speaks to just how fraught the topic is itself but um but I'll share it now and I you know, welcome this kind of conversation as well. But um, I had an unplanned pregnancy that I decided to have an abortion for. And so um, going through the process of that termination really um, opened my eyes to just how um, unsupported um, and scary the experience is and um, really started to think that I wanted to move into doing that kind of work and doing it in a, you know, social justice kind of advocacy oriented way. And at the time, if, if others here have been in the game long enough, you'll know that really this kind of full spectrum doula work wasn't quite as developed as it is now. And, you know, there was, um, you know, the, the um, being an abortion doula was a thing at the time, but from what I remember, um, you you know the, the only training that was available for me was to do a birth doula training, um, and so, you know, I started with that, and then really during that process realized that that kind of support of either helping people um, not have a pregnancy go to term, um, but all, or supporting them through the process of giving birth, um, was really uh, two sides of the same coin for me. And so from the beginning, my entry into this work was um, that intersection of, of loss and, and birth at the same time. Um, so um, after I did this training, I decided to really switch um, careers and kind of go full time. And right as I was starting out, I did have a planned pregnancy. So I was a, I was a very new doula. Um, and then I, at the time, was, you know, very young and didn't want any sonograms and didn't, you know, need, didn't want to have intervention. I was planning a home birth. But my midwife at the time, which maybe some of you know, Tioma Allison, who I miss dearly, um, she, she said, well, you at least need to have an anatomy scan at 20 weeks in order to have a home birth. And so um, when I had the anatomy scan, found out that I was pregnant with twins who were doing well and everything was going fine with the pregnancy, but it was like a huge shock. Obviously, I'd, I had no idea. And so um, 
in the process of switching to complementary care with a high risk OB, I went into labor at 23 weeks and six days. And so, um, you know, when I got to the hospital, I had to make a lot of decisions um, since my babies were on this sort of threshold of viability, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and I was extremely lucky to have a doula with me, um, Megan Davidson, who's here, who, um, you know, at the time was also my doula mentor because I was just starting out. Um, and so I gave birth to my daughters and they were born alive and then they died about a couple hours later in my arms. Um, and I went back to work really six weeks after this um, and just sort of transitioned to full-time doula work, which was, you know, really hard. And again, it was like my lens into this work was always, you know, with this layer of understanding um, the kind of pain and reality of, of the potential for loss while you're trying, um, you know, to have um, reproductive experiences. So this was really just a lot of practice, which is something that I um, really believe in that I had to do a ton of putting aside my own feelings about how I felt about my losses in supporting my clients through their own experiences. Um, so um, then about a year after I started working again, I had two clients within just a couple of months of each other have stillbirth losses at 37 weeks and was kind of really thrown into the experience of supporting um, clients um, give birth to dead babies. And then um, uh, several years after that, I had another uh, uh, unplanned pregnancy, but one that I intended to keep that ended in a miscarriage around 10 weeks um, that I just managed at home, which I'll also talk about a little bit later. So just to give you a sense of um, how I come to it. And, um, you know, I was really kind of swimming in all of these experiences um, and trying to make sense of them. So about five years ago, I started graduate school and um, you know, and really wanted to see both how my clients were individually um, addressing these issues, but also how I was seeing hospital staff sort of ill-equipped or well-equipped to support people through this. And so um, that's kind of what my focus became in graduate school. So, um, so my research, I'm doing a PhD in anthropology at NYU and, um, and also obviously continue to work as a doula, um, but my research really focuses in the United States and it tracks how mourning pregnancy loss is really evolving and has constantly been evolving throughout the history of the United States. So I focus in particular on the United States and a little bit on England, but um, you know, I really look how parents are encouraged to interact with everything that remains after a pregnancy and how this has really changed in the last like 10 to 15 years. Um, so for example, um, how one might be encouraged to sort of take pictures of a baby that is lost or to donate breast milk after a loss. Um, I also look at um, the placenta in particular, which um, maybe some of you all share my love of the placenta as much as I do, but um, in how the placenta itself to me represents both potential and loss in that all of us are here alive because um, the placenta did a really amazing job. And at the same time, it's also the site of almost all pregnancy complications and can really lead to, you know, the loss of a baby and the pregnant person, right? And so the placenta kind of encapsulates all of that. And in addition, the placenta is very much alive throughout the pregnancy and then, and then dies when a baby is born. So um, those are sort of the three areas that I focus on. Um, and um, in addition to that, my program at NYU also um, trains me in documentary filmmaking, and so I started to develop that language as well. And um, I'm currently finishing up a documentary on the placenta called Mother Cake, which will hopefully be out at some point in this life, and, um, and producing also um, a documentary about a feature length documentary about miscarriage called Adventures in Miscarriage, and Cheryl Frajanic, the director of the documentary, is here, um, and that's in development. So we'll keep you all um, posted on how that's going as well. So my focus today, sorry for that really long intro, but um, my focus today is really um, to try to wear both hats, you know, both as an academic and as a doula, and really try to give you all a sense of how I look at the context and history of how pregnancy loss is experienced currently, you know, what contributes to the complexities of going through it personally, um, but also how to practically support clients through this. Um, so, you know, please feel free to um, 
put questions in the Q&A that, you know, address either of this if you want more history and more kind of, um, you know, academic focus, let me know, or if, if you really have very practical questions, I also am happy to answer during, after, you know, whatever. But just to let you know that I'm going to talk about both those things. So, um, so really the, the way that I would um, want to begin is even though we're, you know, we're in um, Pregnancy Loss Awareness Month, um, recently there was obviously this, this sort of very popular um, story of Chrissy Teigen going through pregnancy loss. It's something that's become a little bit more part of our, um, you know, of our vocabulary, but it really is just, it's, it's not a contemporary issue, obviously, right? Like as long as we've been reproducing, there's been the potential for loss and, and you know, that's always been there. And the reason I say that is because I think that um, understanding how varied people's reactions are to, to loss is really important. Um, because I think there's a risk often of prioritizing, you know, either ignoring it or shaming it or not talking about it, silencing it, and at the same time assuming that everybody is having the same kind of pain and loss. And so I think that just understanding that there is such a long history to how pregnancy loss is, um, is experienced is really important. Um, you know, it's generally um, for humans, pregnancy is, you know, really physiologically a normal event, um, but it really is nonetheless a lot riskier for us than, you know, other mammals. And um, I have a particular interest in this just um, because so much of that has to do with the placenta, right? In that our placentas, you know, attach to the uterus in a much more um, you know, one word is invasive, but you could also use a lot of other words, but um, in a really intense way that, you know, it, it is not the same with other, you know, similar mammals. And so um, that is what creates a lot of complications around pregnancy, but also around pregnancy loss, right? Even if a pregnancy doesn't continue, um, experiencing a pregnancy loss at eight, 10 weeks, you know, can be life-threatening to the pregnant person. And that's really unique among mammals. So just to sort of highlight that as well. Um, so, you know, this, this like interest in how birth and death kind of always dance together is, is, um, is very much alive in anthropology, but in very much alive in how I think about this topic. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of really interesting archives of pregnancy loss, um, you know, from like 18th, 19th century that really show women writing, you know, pregnant people writing about pregnancy loss at the time. And even then it was something that was, um, you know, had a range of experiences from, you know, sadness, relief, you know, tragedy, um, you know, mourning an actual life or just being really happy that you don't have to have like your 12th baby, you know, so it's just a lot of um, range in that even, even as far back as we have, you know, written records of it. Um, so that range of feelings has always been there. It's not just something that is to, you know, unique to our contemporary moment. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways that um, pregnancy loss is talked about currently, like why is it so unique now or why is it, you know, experienced in this way? Um, and a lot of that work has been done by medical anthropologists and historians of medicine um, in, in really tracking how technological advances have really influenced our contemporary experiences of both pregnancy and pregnancy loss. So, for example, you know, being able to identify a pregnancy earlier and earlier um, is really unique to our time, right? Because before, you know, pregnancy tests or sonograms, um, you know, the only way a person knew they were pregnant was either, you know, missed menstruation or um, quickening, right? Where you would feel um, a baby moving inside of you. Oh, hi, Jess. Just saw you in there. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, which around four to five months is, is often when quickening happening. So it's really sort of past the highest risk of, of um, first trimester miscarriage. And so, you know, not many people even knew they were pregnant and maybe, you know, had, had a loss, right? So the fact that we can now know um, that we are pregnant, you know, as, as early as two to three weeks past conception is, is a huge change in how... Um, you know, when the 
the experience of feeling pregnant and knowing you're pregnant and starting to think about that future really begins, right? That's a very unique thing um, to, to our contemporary moment. Um, so um, sonograms, for example, a lot of work has been done about this, which is, you know, interesting to think about as, as birth workers and that, you know, so often you see you know, either if you've had a pregnancy yourself, but if you go to a client's house and you see the kind of sonogram pictures on, you know, on people's refrigerators and things, you know, that that for a wanted pregnancy is a really exciting, wonderful thing. You might have, you know, looked at these, these pictures with clients and stuff, but, you know, it's also a super politicized thing, right? And then, you know, the, the way that I'm think about pregnancy loss in the United States is just how fraught it is in terms of reproductive rights. So, um, you know, it really creates, um, you know, it's, it's how access to reproductive rights has often um, been limited and been sort of made to be a more torturous experience in that you um, you know, you have heartbeat laws or laws that require you to have a sonogram or look at the sonogram, right? So even something as sort of benign seeming as a sonogram becomes a very politicized tool, right? So I think that that's also something to, um, to think about when um, meeting people where they're at in terms of how they feel about a pregnancy and an understanding how all of these tools um, have a history and a context and are not necessarily just just benign, even though we may work with people that um, for the most part are um, are having wanted pregnancies. So, um, you know, it's really something that the question of when life begins is sort of always swimming around. Um, and not to go too, too far into the weeds on this, but, um, but I think clearly it's impossible to sort of ignore our current political context. But, um, but just for example, um, you know, something that really changed in terms of obviously Roe v. Wade in 1973 legalizes abortion in the United States um, and really focused on sort of thinking about pregnancy in terms of trimesters, first, second, third trimester, um, the way that the kind of anti-abortion um, that's for you, Megan. The anti-abortion <laughs> um, movement really worked towards uh, trying to to disrupt thinking of pregnancy as trimesters and more about viability, right? So trying to really understand when does a pregnancy um, become viable? When when is a is a is it fetus? a baby, a life, right? And really that the personhood of the pregnancy becomes this really um, important bit in terms of access to reproductive rights. Um, and so what changes big time, and I think it's just important to remember this when we talk about pregnancy losses, um, is the switch from, you know, you have a right to choose to have an abortion at whatever trimester you're at, you know, first and second, um, that the government really takes an interest in in potential life. And that language is very complicated. Um, so I just want us to hold that in mind when we think about pregnancy loss. And it matters because there's just like huge personal, political, legal, and social ramifications of this, right? And I, you know, I think that really using um, the kind of three angles that my own reproductive history has, right? The fact that I had a termination, I had a loss of a wanted pregnancy right on the edge of that viability, and then um, a miscarriage really in the first trimester. Um, it, it, each of those losses is so politicized in, in our current, um, you know, kind of culture around reproductive rights. And I think that that is, uh, unfortunately, is what um, influences how um, this is talked about on, on a larger scale and what kind of sensitivity we have for people going through this experience. Um, so that's just a little bit of like what I think contributes to the shame and silencing around pregnancy loss that we have. But also, for example, when Chrissy Teigen, I'm not sure how many of you followed, uh, you know, she shared pictures of her loss, which I believe was um, somewhere in the second trimester. Um, she received a ton of negative um, backlash, right? And a lot of that backlash was from people who um, 
sort of were calling out her hypocrisy of like, how could she be, you know, sort of left liberal supportive of abortion and then also be mourning a loss at like 19, 20 weeks, right? Like a baby is a baby. So how do you, how do you hold those things together? And I think that that complexity is, um, is something that um, is impossible to ignore. And so I just really want us to think through then how does that affect how we support people as they're going through um, these experiences. The other way in which this is super politicized and, um, and important to mention is just how racialized um, the experience of pregnancy loss is, right? So, you know, we have clearly factors that um, influence people who experience pregnancy loss more, environmental racism, racism in the American, you know, medical care system means that, you know, over two times African-American babies die than white babies, right? It's like, it's a huge um, disparity. And so the issues of equity are sort of always there and really can't be ignored when thinking about reproductive loss. Um, and this really reaches far back into, um, you know, the origins of, of gynecology in this country, right, which really are deeply rooted in the history of slavery. And so I think, again, this is something to really just remember when we're talking about this. Um, so again, sorry that I'm just really just skimming. <laughs> sorry, to clarify, I'm not anti-abortion, but anti the phrase pro-life. Yes, Megan and I fight about that all the time. Um, she's pro-abortion. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, okay, so um, so I'm sorry if I'm just skimming this, and please um, call me out on stuff, you know, or like tell me to focus more on things or whatever in the Q and I'm, I'm totally open to all of that. Uh, okay, so you know, so transitioning to just a, a more kind of practical approach, um, and to give you a sense of you know some other numbers, which I'm sure many of you are all very familiar with, and this has been a lot of the activism of of people who have experienced pregnancy loss, kind of getting these numbers out there and getting people to recognize just how common it is, um, which is really amazing work that has happened. So you know, sort of the biggest, most popular number people quote is one in four pregnancies of recognized pregnancies ends in miscarriage, right? Which is an incredibly high number, um, which means that if you work with pregnant people, um, you, you know, they will already either have an experience, uh, you know, of a history of loss, or if they hire you early enough, they may experience a loss themselves um, that, you know, you may, you may need to support them through. And so stillbirth, thankfully, is a little less common. It affects about 1% of pregnancies. Um, and there's a little less number, um, you know, good, reliable statistics of like second trimester losses, but uh, the one in four recognized pregnancies goes all the way to uh, 24 weeks is, is what they're um, recognizing in that number. So it's, it's just a lot. Um, so, you know, I think that um, something that Cheryl and I have been tracking, for example, in in um, development of this documentary that we're working on is especially how the conversation has really changed in that so many more people are kind of declaring publicly celebrities or public figures that they've had um, miscarriages and that's really changed the conversation. For example, um, you know, Beyonce, Michelle Obama, we have a whole, we have lists and lists of people that have come out talking about their miscarriages. And that um, has been a real shift, right? Because historically, um, it was really kind of silenced and shamed, right? And, um, you know, what, uh, what starts to happen in hospitals, at least, and I think this is important if you're helping clients through um, any kind of loss in the hospital, is that they really begin changing how they support families um, that are going through reproductive loss. And this happens around the same time that theories about the importance of bonding with babies um, starts to emerge, which is like a very interesting relationship that, um, that uh, I don't necessarily know why it happened. And that's part of my research, but you know, typical in American hospitals pre 1980s was, um, you know, if you were having a loss, either stillbirth or a late miscarriage, um, often the doctor would drug you. So you'd be sort of semi-conscious giving birth, um, the baby taken away immediately, um, and all sorts of admonitions against, you know, not holding the baby, um, that that was going to cause trauma, that you shouldn't name 
the baby that you should sort of just pretend as if it had never happened and very quickly get to having another baby. Um, and often they would drug you for like three days afterwards. So almost as if you would just, um, forget as if it never happened, right? And then we have, you know, starting in the 70s, a lot of development around the theories around bonding with your baby, skin to skin, um, the role of oxytocin in parenting. And so hospitals start to change um, their policies around people having live births and that, you know, people want to have their babies with them and not taken away and not going to the nurseries. And this starts to change how hospitals also address pregnancy loss. And so we start to see, and a lot of this, you know, it's been theorized different ways, but that nurses are really the ones who start to develop a lot of these practices, um, being the people who are there um, in the hospital room for longer often than, you know, um, an OB or a midwife, and um, it, encouraging having, you know, pictures taken of the baby at whatever, you know, sort of gestational age, naming the baby, spending time with the baby. Um, I'm looking at a particular um, device that's called the Cuddle Cot that is like a little refrigerated bassinet that is available in a lot of hospitals in the U.S., um, but it, it started in the U.K. and, you know, it allows the corpse of the baby to stay cool so that parents who want to spend more time, which is the language that they use, um, you know, getting to know the baby that, you know, uh, it's sort of like slows down decomposition. And, you know, all of these things are, are very recent, right? I would say really picking up in, you know, sort of the late 80s and the 90s and, and the cuddle cot is something that's only been around for, you know, less than 10 years. So um, it's, a, it's a huge shift in, um, in what's happening um, in hospitals from what, what used to happen. And this is important in that when we're helping families, um, what they're encountering at the hospital varies, obviously hospital to hospital, but also might be really different from what their parents experienced or other family members. And often that's a lot of what we're having to help people navigate is how they might be supported um, and experiencing the loss is very different to you know, how people talked about it. So often, you know, you'll have stories of like a grandmother say, you know, like, oh, I had a lot, you know, but just had never talked about it, or you never knew that people had had losses. And so it's a very, um, it's a very big shift in a short amount of time. Um, so, um, you know, other, other things that are, again, politicized is that, uh, when the loss happens, whenever the loss happens, um, people are, increasingly, uh, there's not a ton of proof, but there's an association that, you know, anti-abortion groups are really wanting to have access to the remains. So let's say you have a loss at 16 weeks that requires you go to the hospital, you then want actually to take whatever remains home. Whereas really if, if a baby dies in the hospital or you lose the fetus, you know, and I use the language interchangeably knowing it's very complicated, um, but only to say that, um, typically, a hospital would treat those remains as medical waste and sort of incinerate it, right? And what starts to happen is parents are really wanting access to that to be able to bury or cremate. Um, and that becomes politicized, as you see, for example, um, in Indiana, um, when Mike Pence was the um, governor, really signed a law in um, that's been challenged, but still that really required anybody that had a loss in a hospital at whatever gestational age to contact a funeral home and have to bury or cremate um, the remains, right? So it's always kind of dancing between acknowledging someone's personal um, relationship to the loss and also knowing it's happening within a context of, you know, a real effort to take away um, reproductive rights in a real misogynist culture, right? So um, this is a, is a hard dance to do, especially when you're supporting people, right? Um, and we can talk more about what, how we sort of navigate our own feelings around that and, and wherever we're meeting people at. Um, depending on on how they're wanting to deal with the loss that they're having, um, so uh, I'm gonna. Are we okay on time, Ashley? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna um, give some real practical tips, and then maybe we can open it up um, if if um, if that feels right, um, timing wise. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, Alrighty. So. 
You know, I think the thing, and I'm speaking as a doula, but I, I, I know that there's lots of us here that are, are coming from lots of different, you know, um, trainings and perspectives. But uh, I think that the, the beautiful thing about being a doula is that it already, you know, we've already been really primed for this kind of support, right? In that, you know, we meet people where they're at, we're respecting individual choices, we're not sort of putting what we think is the right thing to do, um, you know, on somebody. And so I think that, you know, those skills really continue in helping make people make decisions. They really continue if a pregnancy ends um, in a loss, right? And so I think remembering that it's really the same kind of approach. Um, and so maybe just some specific things that are different, obviously, is what I would sort of go through right now, but just reminding um, reminding us that there's already so much in our toolkit of um, of being able to support people in a way that nobody else might, right? Like nurses, doctors, OBs, family members. It's a very unique role that we occupy and that, you know, in the same way that we um, support people in having a live birth, it's, it's similar for a pregnancy loss, right? So first thing will be, um, I think what's very complicated is around language. You know, so I, th I think that because of all the sort of uh, politics of whether you call it a fetus or a baby or whatever, you really want to be mindful of how the person who's experiencing this loss refers to what it is that, you know, they feel they lost, right? Um, and I think that it's it's just really important to mirror that. And so I would never use a term baby for a client who uses fetus, for example, right? I just um, would really respect that because it's actually incredibly painful um, to, to have... Um, to not have that respected, right? And conversely, um, if someone wants to talk about the baby that they lost at 10 weeks, I talk about the baby that they lost at 10 weeks, right? Um, and so whenever a client shares that they have a history of miscarriage or they miscarried, I do always say, you know, I'm sorry. Um, and I, I have a moment of sensitivity around that. I don't treat it like, like they just told me they had a leap procedure. You know, I do, I do treat it with sensitivity, but I don't assume that, um, that what they're experiencing is a loss of a baby. Um, so I think you really want to take their lead here. It's, it's really important. Um, for uh, how to support people through, um, you know, sort of medical care, um, you know, the, the, the earlier the loss, right, anything before 12 weeks, it's very common that they may not have very good support from their care provider, right? Sometimes care providers won't even see people until eight or 10 weeks. Um, and that's a pretty significant loss if it happens at home physically um, and emotionally. And so um, remembering that they have, you know, known they're pregnant for a really long time, you know, often. And so um, I think that in order to to prepare for this, sometimes clients reach out really soon, right? They get really excited. They just found out they're pregnant and they let you know that they want to work with a doula. And this has happened to me many, many times. And then they sort of let me know that they um, they miscarried or they had a loss or there was no heartbeat when they went into their, you know, first um, doctor's appointment. And so I, I'm always sort of available for navigating, you know, the specifics of this. And so I think that if you don't have experience with this or you really are, um, sort of nervous about it, you can try to find out as much as possible, talk to other doulas that have, you know, that have experience supporting this. But things that would be important is, you know, sort of what happens if they start bleeding at home. Um, lots of people start um, miscarrying at home and, and it can be, you know, really intense, um, you know, and, and knowing what's normal and what's not is really important, right? How much blood is okay? When should they go to the hospital? You know, what might it feel like physically? What are some ways to, you know, manage the physical intensity of what they're going through? Um, so I think educating oneself about, you know, just how much can happen even in a first trimester miscarriage is, is really important because lots of people who have had miscarriages will share that, you know, the lack of, you know, the sensitivity or even availability of their care providers is, is just one of the ways in which that experience becomes so much more traumatic, right? Um, not even being able to get someone on the phone, um, not knowing whether you go to the emergency room or, you know, if it's in the middle of the night, do you go to, you know, regular emergency room, labor and delivery, you know, sort of navigating all of that is, is really hard. And, um, you know, I'm happy to answer specific questions around that. Um, so being available during this time, I think is really important, which is what I, you know, even if a client hasn't hired me, I will say, you know, 
just, if, if anything is going on, you can always call me and let me know, you know, how I can help, right? Um, the other thing they often have to navigate is decisions around if they have officially, you know, miscarried or there's no heartbeat, you know, is it expectant management, meaning are they waiting for the body to sort of miscarry on its own or are they going to do a medical abortion at home or are they going to need a DNC, which means they're having to go into a doctor's office or the hospital, depending on, you know, where you are. Um, and so I think that, you know, the further along a pregnancy, the more it's going to require a hospital stay and an induction likely and helping clients through this is just, is, is invaluable. Preparing them for what they might face, um, how to talk to the staff about what they'll need or being there in person, if that's available, if that's an option um, where you're located. Um, I think what happens to the physical body is something that, you know, doesn't get talked about. Um, we know that things that have to do with um, pregnant bodies are already not talked about, but especially for a loss, how um, cramping, contractions, the sort of physical intensity of it, making decisions over pain management at home, at the hospital. Um, I've had, for example, many clients who've had losses and the, you know, have had to uh, induce at the hospital and the decision over whether to have an epidural or not becomes such a sort of sensitive fraught thing in that, you know, maybe they were planning for their pregnancy not to have an epidural, you know, if they had made it to full term. And so then making that decision becomes just such a, such another layer of, of sort of mourning and, and loss simultaneously, not wanting to feel any physical pain because of just how emotionally difficult the situation is. Right. So I think that, um, non-judgmental support around pain management is, is really important um, in, you know, um, supporting clients through this. Uh, I think also often I have clients who are now pregnant and past and sort of getting ready for a live birth and have had a miscarriage and have a lot of sort of uh, fear around how it felt to, to miscarry at home and how early labor might feel or how, you know, pushing my feel. And so, um, again, remembering that, you know, most people, probably have an experience of miscarriage is important when you're talking to them about what kind of decisions they want to make for their birth um, if they've had a miscarriage in the past. <clears throat> I think what happens when you miscarry at home is something that doesn't get talked about. What do you do with what comes out of you, right? At whatever stage you are um, in the pregnancy, it can be incredibly alarming how much blood comes out, incredibly traumatic to have actual fetal remains come out, which you know, the way things are currently in medical care, it is possible for you to have a miscarriage at home and pass what is like a recognizable fetus and like nobody tells you what to do, right? Your doctor doesn't tell you what to do and you have no idea, like, do you flush it? Do you, you know, what do you do? And so I think knowing that that um, is an experience that so many people have had and that there is a range of options. Um, I've had clients, um, you know, flush everything down and be totally okay with that. Other clients sort of scoop things out and have some kind of burial or some kind of, you know, mourning process that they have And that, you know, I think being comfortable with a lot of this is, is part of what's hard about pregnancy loss. It's just the, um, what is it that we're mourning? What is it that was lost? Like these questions are really deep and uncomfortable for ourselves, but i um, really trying to know that there's a range, um, which is what I keep saying, but that's like, basically my main takeaway is just the spectrum of um, feelings around it that are really important to honor. So um, the other sort of thing in terms of the body and which many of you probably already know, but, you know, starting around 16 weeks um, in a pregnancy, your body starts to get ready to make milk. And so if you have a loss um, around then, after then, um, it's very possible that your body will make milk, right? And so helping clients through this process is, is incredibly helpful. I have never in all the years of doing this work have had a doctor or an OB let my client know that their milk might come in, which is just sort of obscene. Um, and so, um, you know, even at a full-term loss. And so I think guiding people through this is super important, asking them if they want to, you know, avoid it as much as possible, suppress this process, which inevitably happens, or if they want to, you know, encourage it by pumping and donating. Um, that's something that for a lot of people is very healing. Um, and so, you know, connecting them to people who maybe have low milk supply and want breast milk, um, or a milk bank, um, or, you know, just for a little bit. Like the other day I had a client that had a loss 
around um, 24 weeks. And she was like, yes, I want to pump. And, and we got her all set up, ready to pump. And then she pumped once and was like, I don't want to do that anymore. That's horrible. And so then it was a process of helping her, you know, manage her milk that had come in quite heartily and make sure that she didn't get into any trouble, right? In terms of plug ducts and all that. So um, just making space for just how varied that response to even that can be. Um, even if you decide to pump how quickly I, I pumped for about three weeks. Um, and then, and then it was only a reminder of the absence. And so that's when I decided to stop. But initially, it helped me feel very positive about my body's ability to do something. Um, and to give the milk to my doula trainer actually is who I gave her baby, um, my breast milk to. Um, and that felt really healing at the time. So um, I think the other thing that I really sort of often help clients through um, is talk to family or friends, right? I think that that is something that we do as doulas when they're having a live birth. Um, and I think that, you know, the pregnant person, partner, family is really overwhelmed. Um, and I think that, you know, working to establish the kind of support they're seeking is really important. So letting family know, for example, if the baby has a name or if, or if the, you know, if the, the pregnant person doesn't want to talk about it that way, you know, just really facilitating um, what kind of language the family should use, how to honor the loss, what to expect when they come home from the hospital, um, explaining the medical procedures. That's all stuff that is as equally um, helpful um, for a loss as it would be for a live birth. Um, and so I think it's, it's invaluable to offer that up um, if you feel like you can do that, to offer that up to, to clients um, if they're going through a loss. And I think it also allows the family to say things and ask things that they wouldn't necessarily ask the person going through the experience. Um, and that has been something that I think is, is bo both sides have really appreciated when I've done it. I think supporting partners is something that is sort of woefully ignored in all of this. And so, you know, just, just knowing that it's not just the person who's pregnant going through this, but if they have a partner, um, they also are having their own feelings and, and kind of, um, complex relationship to this. So remembering that as well, I think is important. Um, and then I think the other sort of thing is, is really, and I'm close to wrapping up here, is, um, is really time. You know, sometimes people are really not ready to talk about a loss in the moment. And so making yourself really available for processing later on, if that's something that you feel is, is okay, is super helpful. Um, you know, I had a client once who had a stillbirth at 37 weeks and um, was very clear that um, she did not want anybody, she didn't want to see the baby. She didn't, she called it a fetus. Um, she wanted everybody to call it a fetus. Uh, she, even though the hospital was very intensely pressuring her to hold it, to name it, to do all that, she was, you know, adamant about not doing that. And so um, the nurses were really upset about that, obviously. I mean, it was like a, you know, a full term loss. And so they had sort of, swaddled the baby and kind of put a little hat on it and like put it in this little like nurse's room or whatever. And I, you know, and they came and they're like, you know, wanted to talk to me about how um, upset they were that this client didn't even want to see it. And so I went and took some pictures and I think that was probably my own, um, my own personal relationship to this that I just thought she might want to have this. Um, and, but, and I mentioned to her that I had done this and I was like, you never have to look, nothing, it's all good. And then, you know, like three weeks later, she called me when I went over to her house for postpartum and she said that she did want to see. And so I showed her and she just looked at one picture just very briefly and just never looked again and didn't want them or anything. But I'm grateful to, to having had the opportunity to, um, to, you know, share that with her if she wanted. And so often that is a little bit how picture taking gets talked about. You may not want to see it now, but you want to see it later, you know, and this is, I think there's not an easy answer there. Um, maybe it was wrong that I took those pictures. I don't know. But, you know, I was glad that when she asked to see it, I was able to, to offer that up to her, right? So I think that just making space for, you know, the, the unique process that is grief is, is important. Um, so I think I'll, um, ooh, what did someone say? Yeah, Jade, um, that some medical professionals will refer to miscarriage as an abortion because medically it's the same to them. Um, I, I do think it's worth warning people about that. Absolutely. Um, 
I think that's a really great point. Uh, I think that, you know, letting people know just all the range of things people might say, including the opposite, including if someone is going in for um, a DNC of a miscarriage that happened in the first trimester, and to them, it's not a baby. And, you know, people might be very sensitive and sort of talking about the miscarriage and a baby. And, you know, and I think that that's also, you know, getting a sense of where your client is and then helping them prepare for how the staff might respond in either direction. Um, so I, um, okay, I'm going to wrap it up and then open it up and listen to this. Um, I just want to say thank you, skimming the surface. Um, and, you know, I just hope it plants seeds for sort of the variety of reproductive experiences that we go through and support as birth workers. And let's open it up. Yeah, Ashley? Okay, so I'm just going to read what Lindsay said. Um, can yeah, we while you're reading, I'll just say oh, if other okay. folks have questions too, just we can keep putting questions in there. This one is good, so it'll start us off well. Great. Can we talk about a bit about the long-term effects of pregnancy loss. I'm working with a client who had an abortion about seven years ago and is just starting to process and talk about it now after suppressing it for years. And I'm curious about ways I can support her through energetic womb healing. Where are you, Lindsay? Oh, I can't see your video. Oh, sorry. That's okay. You don't have to, but hi. Um, I don't know anything about energetic womb healing. If anybody else has, has um, you know, um, any tips about that, please, please sort of um, jump in. I'll just say that, um, yeah, I see. Um, I think that, you know, I ask clients, you know, to tell me their, their sort of pregnancy history and medical history and that it's relevant when I'm in the hospital with them. And so, you know, but sometimes uh, even then clients don't always reveal stuff to me and it only comes up later or they mention, I had a client once who didn't mention it till after she had the baby. Um, and so I think what I would say is um, I would just, I mean, I would ask clients, like, do you think that there's anything, you know, I asked if there's anything physically they think might be sort of an issue that comes up in pregnancy or anything emotionally that might come up in the labor and just sort of leaving it open. Um, Lindsay, can I just ask you, is this a client who's who's been very clear about that? That's something that they're working through or they just said they had an abortion and something that you're, you're thinking of. Um, um, they, is that okay that I unmuted myself? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just be on the recording. So if that's okay with you. Oh yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> this client, uh, we're working together on actually like connecting more to her menstrual cycle, but she has brought up, wanting to process like wanting to connect more to her womb after having the abortion and that's why she's wanting to connect more to her menstrual cycle and in our past few sessions the abortion came up each time so i definitely know that that's something that she is wanting to process and talk more about yeah i mean does anybody can jump in with that i mean i just i feel like it's something that we can all um Go ahead, Megan. Megan saying holding space just emotionally, which it sounds like you're doing, Lindsay. I would also add that next week we're doing a conversation on havening. And I think some people on here have like are familiar with it, but it's a psychosensory. It's sort of like I'm not super familiar, which is why we're doing a conversation on it. Um, but it's like a tapping, touching, like a like a way that you physically connect to yourself to try to process through emotions like trauma and stress. And, um, and so I think that's helpful. Also like EFT tapping um, can be really helpful for people, other sorts of journaling exercises, writing letters. Like those are things that come to mind for us that we would walk students through. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a lot else folks can maybe even put in suggestions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I was just going to say holding space, yes, as an emotional process and also just acknowledging that, um, that people are often really already the experts in themselves. And so when somebody's talking to you about something that some work they want to do or some process they're going through or some place that they're trying to get to emotionally, there's often a lot of wisdom in asking them what's working for them, what they're doing, what's worked in the past. 
um, you know, what resonates with them because you're so much more likely to be able to give them something that then makes the connection for them if you already have a sense of where their starting place is, right? Because we're so, so very different. So like all these different types of modalities that, you know, Ashley's talking about, there are going to be some folks for whom those are really good and working functions. And then somebody else might say something like, you know, I hate all those kinds of techniques and none of those things resonate with me and something totally else would be more what resonated with them. So I think holding space is also about really prioritizing people's expertise in themselves. That's why Megan was my doula. <laughs> um, for clients who are struggling to figure out how to honor pregnancy loss, do you give suggestions? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. Um, thank you. Um, absolutely. I, um, the other day, the, the client that I was talking about who, um, who had a loss around 24 weeks, um, when I was talking to, you know, and this is a family who had been very clear with me that, that they lost a baby and they had a name for him and they wanted their family to really, um, to really lead with that. They wanted the family to be on FaceTime when the baby was born that, you know, so I spoke to the family, um, and I, and, and to, to the couple as well, but, um, so something that my own brother did, and again, this is just the more experiences you, you sort of have personally or with clients that these ideas just start coming up. Um, my own brother planted, um, you know, two trees for the twins. And it's like, was a beautiful thing and that they keep growing and giving fruit and stuff. And so I mentioned that to, um, to the grandparents and, um, and the grandma, you know, got very emotional and said, oh, you know, I did that for my, my two grandsons, you know, that, that were born alive. Um, and I was like, well, I think that it would be, and again, I only said this because this is how the couple felt about their loss. Right. But I was like, I think that that would be an incredible way of honoring this baby. Um, because then, you know, you're sort of acknowledging, um, that it, it's a baby in the same way, um, as you know, your, your grandchildren who are alive are. And so she just felt really like, great, I have a concrete thing to do um, that is going to be really helpful to the, to this family. Right. So I do sometimes give things like that. I also had a client who had um, a loss and then got a, like a, a park, a bench in Prospect Park that they put the name of the baby in and, you know, something that every year they go and, um, and sit and sort of remember the baby. And so I think that the, the sort of, I'm going to finish what I'm saying and then read what Megan's saying. Sorry. Um, is, um, it's like, uh, is that, you know, and this is, this is something that for other kinds of losses, right. And this is something Cheryl and I, you know, really talk about in, in thinking about, um, making a film around this is really creating a language around, you know, how people cope with miscarriage and pregnancy losses that, there are sort of already established cultural historical rituals for mourning other kinds of losses, right? You have funerals, you have wakes, you have, you know, people like know what to say, you know, what, where is with pregnancy loss, there's really not, you know, people are making it up as they go. And so I do offer people specific things that I've just seen people make up, right? Like every year I have, you know, like a, a dinner with Megan every year I, you know, like, honor them in my own special way. Right. And so I think that I, I do offer specific suggestions. Um, and I think that sometimes things that are, um, you know, different than what would be for a typical sort of like an adult or, you know, a human that dies that, <laughs> that would have like a socially recognized loss, um, you know, mourning process, I think is important to help people come up with some of that. Um, maybe you'd like to talk to people about how to manage their own emotions while being present for clients, because it can be incredibly hard to hold space while going through a lot of feelings yourself. Um, yes. And I also saw Noli saying that you want to become a bereavement doula. I will send, um, um, Ashley, if it's, I can send some stuff later and maybe you can follow up. There's a couple of, there's one place in particular in California. That's really great that I just learned about that. I'll send, um, that link for, um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of managing your own, you know, Megan knows this in that, you know, my own, the first time I had to help a client, you know, that one client who didn't want to sort of 
you know, see the baby or anything. Well, that was really hard for me because that hadn't been my experience, right? Like I did want to hold my babies and name them and take pictures of them and all of that. And so, you know, I had to several times sort of go outside the room and, you know, in the same way we would manage our own emotions during, you know, a live birth. But um, and I never suggested that the better thing for her to do was, um, was the thing that the hospital was suggesting, right? And just really just to help to process what was the right thing for them to do. And I think that um, I just had to talk to, to Megan and to, to friends a lot about how difficult that was and being very sad. You know, I think it's, uh, I remember doing a workshop about this a while ago and someone, you know, being like, well, I think I would just cry so much while it was happening. And at the, you know, I do cry at birth and stuff. It's not like, it's like you know, I'm not a... Um, a robot, but um, I do try to, meaning I cry sometimes out of joy, right? If a client has an experience that they're really happy about, I'm just a, a cancer. So I do cry a lot. But um, but if someone is like, I, I would never let my own emotions sort of um, overwhelm the situation, right? So if I need to cry, I might kind of, you know, during a loss, go call Megan and cry, <laughs> you know, by myself somewhere and kind of come back and process after the birth, you know, really try to not make it at all about what I'm feeling um, and really meet them where they're at. Um, so, but it's, this isn't, it's, it's, it's in no way expected that you could support someone through this without having your own um, feelings of sadness or it, it triggering your own past experiences of loss. I mean, it's just impossible that that wouldn't happen, but just, I think managing it is important um, and not sort of letting your own feelings take over. There's also a lot of really great memoirs. I can also send um, Ashley that are, yeah, that's really great um, language, Winona. Um, you know, walking alongside the person going through the loss. And that's what, you know, often holding space is about, right? But I think that um, I'm happy to send some really great memoirs that I've read. Um, Cheryl and I really love this um, one psychologist based out of the UK um, called Julia Bueno. Um, and her book is called, Cheryl, what's it called? On the Brink of Being. Um, it's fantastic um, because she writes about her own pregnancy losses, but also um, being a therapist and helping clients through all sorts of, and she kind of divides it up by trimesters, which is an interesting thing. Um, but the language and how she kind of holds both is really fascinating. Um, so I highly recommend. I'll just jump in to say too, last week we had some, some folks were on that call too. Um, Jessica Wade is a mom um, who had twins and lost one of the babies early on after a very complicated story, actually, which she tells that I won't go into detail on, but she spoke a lot about having babies in the NICU for a long time and mm -hmm. navigating that side of it. Um, and so just if anybody is looking for more information on that, it was really like amazing the same thing like what do you do personally navigating sort of with friends and family and lots of different things to think about um i don't really know where the hour went stephanie i feel like you've been talking for like 20 minutes maybe <laughs> like it was so fast sorry if i talked too much yeah no no i think it was good like i was really engaged and i looked up and i was like oh my gosh it's yeah. time like <laughs> i feel like we have a lot more to talk about here so I'll just say, you know, again, if anybody, um, maybe I can just put my email on here, but um, if anybody wants to um, follow up with any questions, um, please, I'm, I'm happy to. This is something that I'm really trying to, <laughs> I'm really trying to um, be a lot more engaged in and available for um and and, and helping other birth workers so please um reach out also um i actually if it's if it's if that's possible i can send you a list of really great resources that i really love and you'll send to people who signed up um yeah, definitely we would love to do that here let me stop the recording just to give folks a chance to unmute if they want to um